Excellent. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Rajav Govind Jha to uh, speak to us. He's in his postdoc at Syracuse University and worked with Simon Catterall before that, another friend. Uh, so I would hand over to you, uh, Rajav. He's going to tell us about holographic okay. gauge theories on the lattice. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Denjo, for the invitation to speak in this seminar. Uh, today I'll be talking about this uh, title you see is about, I'll be talking about some holographic gauge theories on the lattice. This is based on the two papers which are mentioned here. And there are some paperwork which are in progress. Uh, okay, so let me start by just giving a sketch outline of my talk. Uh, I'll just introduce holography just for sake of completeness quickly. And then I'll uh, mention the supersymmetric gauge theories on the lattice. What is the motivation and why we want to study? Uh, and what are the methods which have been developed by several people, groups over the past uh, two decades to study these theories of the lattice. And especially I'll start with n equal to four super Yang Mills uh, in four dimensions, which is a well-known uh, super conformal gauge theory, supersymmetric gauge theory. And then what I'll do is I'll not, I, I'll just introduce it in four dimensions, but I'll do a dimensional reduction down to three dimensions where the n equal to four, which has 16 supercharges, real supercharges, is known as n equal to eight super angles. And then I'll try to uh, show some results of our studies of this theory in the large and limit at finite temperatures. And then I'll shift gears and go to matrix model, which is a one dimensional matrix model, well-known matrix model, which has a holographic interpretation, which is known as BMN matrix model after the paper which was mentioned in the abstract, which uh, you must have received in the email. And then I'll just, once I finish discussing that BMN matrix model and what we are trying to do in that model, uh, I'll go to some uh, future directions and open problems. Okay. So what is the idea of holography? Basic idea is very well known to most of the people who are doing theoretical physics. Uh, is that the quant uh, some quantum gravitational theory in G plus one dimensions is related to uh, some pair, its pair of quantum field theory without gravity in one fewer dimension on its boundary. Uh, it is now sort of widely believed that any theory of quantum gravity, at least in different approaches which we have, string theory, loop down quantum gravity, causal dynamic sets and other things, one uh, sort of widely believe thing is that uh, quantum gravity, any future complete consistent quantum gravity theory will be holographic. And this was initially proposed, it came into theoretical physics in the 70s uh, when Hawking and Bekenstein uh, found out that the black hole entropy goes as area, not as volume as expected. So there's some sort of a dimensional reduction, which is at work when we talk about uh, places in physics where quantum mechanics and gravity both play the role. Uh, in some theory of quantum gravity. So the holography uh, took a concrete form in 97 when the well-known ADS-CFT conjecture was proposed by Juan Maldacena. And this, is, this was a conjecture uh, that related a five-dimensional quantum theory of gravity uh, in anti dissiter space-time to a four-dimensional uh, super conformal field theory on its boundary. And the best known conjecture was in the decoupling limit, which is just the limit that n goes to infinity, which is the planar limit. And the Thoft coupling, which I'll explain later in my talk, is large. So in that case, the quantum gravity theory in the bulk reduces to uh, Einstein-like gravity, basically classical uh, super gravity. So that was the ADS-CFT conjecture, which was given in 97. But this is not related. There's nothing special about ADS-CFT or the basic idea to the pair of four and five dimensions. So as I mentioned, this was ADS-5 times some CFT-4. But soon after, it was realized that uh, several maximal supersymmetric gauge theories 
in dimensions d less than four also have a holographic interpretation, even though they are not conformal. So for example, uh, when I talk about a three dimensional supersymmetric theory with 16 maximum number of supercharges, even that has a well-defined holographic uh, you know, dual. And the statement which was proposed or conjectured in this paper, which is mentioned below, is that uh, the uh, idea that the maximal supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, by maximally supersymmetric, what I mean is uh, it has a maximum number of supersymmetries. You, you can have varying amount of supersymmetry in various dimensions. So uh, this is a statement about maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, which has, so in this case, it means that it has 16 supercharges. So the statement is that the maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills theory in P plus one dimensions is dual to some DP brains in supergravity at low temperatures. So low temperature is a strong coupling in this case. And we have to take a special limit, which is known as a decoupling limit, which is larger than strong coupling. So in, rephrased in other words, it just says that supergravity solutions, which corresponds to some P plus one dimensional super angle theory, are black P brain solutions. So there's a direct map between the gauge theory without gravity and the black hole solutions in classical supergravity. So in this talk, what I'll do is, so if I just take P equal to three, I reduce to the well-known N equal to four case, which is ADS safety correspondence. But in this talk, what I'll only do is I'll talk about P less than three. Uh, so I will not talk about P equal to three, but I'll just talk about P less than. And that is the motive, uh, that is the purpose of this talk. I'll talk about P equal to zero, which is the BMN model. Uh, some deformation of P equal to zero is the BMN model. And then I'll talk about P equal to two, which is the three dimensional N equal to eight super length. So as I have already remarked, a class of super Yang theory, but all the supersymmetric theories which are known to have a well-defined holographic dual description descend from the same 10 dimensional N equal to one super Yang theory. So these are, these have all 16 real, uh, real supercharges. Non-maximal SUSY theories, at least I am not very familiar about whether they admit a clear cut holographic dual. Certainly not Einstein like grav super gravity, uh, gravity. So what do I mean by these class of super angular theory? So let's start with this action, uh, which is the 10 dimensional N equal to one super angular action. You just have the two terms. Uh, one is the uh, fermionic term and the second is the uh, gauge term. And then once I reduce this six, this is a 16 supercharge uh, theory, n equal to one super angle. When I reduce it to d equal to six, it's n equal to two well-known n equal to two super conformal field theory. In d equal to four, it's the n equal to four super angle theory. And this is what we are going to talk about today. And this is also something which we have studied, but I will not be talking about it now. So this is all class of 16 supercharge theory, which admit the holographic, admit holographic description. These are interesting in their own right, but with respect to holography, not so important, and probably will not discuss this further. So we'll just focus on the 16 supercharge. ADS CFP correspondence. One of the uh, one of the basic thing about the ADS CFP correspondence is it's a strong weak duality. And in any strong weak duality, it is often not possible to compute on both sides simultaneously. So this opens up the possibility of exploring the strongly coupled field theory using well-known Mattis methods, and then compare to results obtained from weakly coupled quantum gravity. So let's keep the gravity theory weakly coupled and keep the gauge theory strongly coupled. So on the gravity side, we, uh, string theorists have already calculated a lot of uh, non-trivial uh, thermodynamic quantities and uh, other things. So if you can study the same, same uh, uh, thing on the lattice using gauge theory, and you obtain the same answer, you know that the duality is correct. Or in the sense that if you see that it's not agreeing, then maybe there are uh, uh, corrections to the duality. So this, non, this is a non-trivial check because we are computing, uh, we are computing two, uh, two things on different sides and then seeing whether they agree in the region where the expectation uh, is that they should. But these gauge theories are not easy to study on the lattice. They are already complicated because of the requirement of extended supersymmetry. As I already mentioned, these holographic theories admit 
uh, uh, sorry, these holographic queries only have holographic description if they are 16 supercharges, and those are known as extended supersymmetry gauge queries. So extended supersymmetry and the requirement of large and weak things very difficult. In addition, there are more compli other complications like taking the continuum limit properly and so on. This is not a very easy problem. And this has been studied by several groups and this is an ongoing program. And some of what I'll say is, uh, is part of uh, all this we want to study. So to, to introduce the lattice construction, uh, I'll first uh, talk about n equal to four super Yang's theory. So as I've already mentioned, it's obtained by dimensionally reducing the 10 dimensional super Yang's theory down to four dimensions. This theory is a super conformal field theory. Uh, beta function uh, vanishes to all new orders. This theory consists of six scalars, six dual formulas. They're all masters and in the adjoint representation of the SU and gauge group. Uh, this is probably the, arguably the simplest interacting TFT in four dimensions without uh, gravity. And this is uh, important for theories because there are certain things which we can study in this and then uh, use it to study other complicated theories. I'm not writing down the action specifically, but the action has the usual uh, gauge kinetic term, uh, Utah interaction between the fermions uh, and the scalar fields. There's a commuted uh, quartic scalar commutator term, uh, which is related to the famous flat directions uh, in all these maximal supersymmetric gauge theories. And they're all the term, uh, these terms in the action are related by supersymmetry. The super conformal algebra includes uh, SU4 uh, uh, symmetry, which is part of the R symmetry group, apart from the usual SO4 or SO3, comma one. Euclidean or Lorentzian group. At finite temperatures, uh, Suzy is broken uh, because uh, uh, the uh, you have uh, so at t equal to zero, this is the exact supersymmetric theory. But as you uh, put this at finite temperatures, uh, you don't have this cancellation between the terms, and the Suzy is broken. And in that limit, this theory is often uh, dubbed as being a close cousin of QCD, even though this n equal to four is completely non-physical. There's nothing physical about this theory, but in some finite temperature regime, there are some things which uh, is uh, similar to what we see. So that is one of the motivation of people, for people studying this theory. Uh, maybe we can someday know about QCD string or things about QCD by studying this theory or looking at other features of this theory. So now let me go to talking about supersymmetry on the lattice, because as I mentioned that I'll introduce supersymmetry for this n equal to four super angles. So what is the problem of doing supersymmetry on the lattice? One of the problems is that it's already starting, uh, even just starting from the basic idea of uh, the Suzy algebra, we know that Q, Q bar supercharges and uh, Q bar uh, gives and commutator gives you a momentum p mu, which is which generates infinitesimal translation, which is broken already on the lattice. So Suzy algebra is not satisfied at only at, uh, even at the classical level. So maybe it's right at the outset it's difficult to study on the lattice. But there have been approaches by all these people in 2000 to 2010 using different approaches, uh, and they came up with this idea that one should not try to uh, keep all the supersymmetry of the continuum theory on the lattice, but only preserve some subset of this algebra and check or expect that the supersymmetry is restored as the continuum limit is taken. This is more easily said than done, but uh, we'll see that in lower dimension, this is easier. In four dimensions, it's more complicated and, and I won't go into that story, but the basic idea is that you start with, a, you want to target uh, uh, Suzy theory, which has 16 supercharges, but you want to preserve only some subset of that. And then as you take the continuum limit, you uh, do some fine tuning to get the correct target theory. So the, there are two approaches. One is the topology, uh, uh, topological twisting approach, and other is the orbifold approach. I'll be talking about uh, the topological twisting, which produces the exact nil potent supercharge, as I'll mention in the next slide. So these are the progress which have been made related to lattice supersymmetry. And even after making all this effort, 
and trying to preserve a subset of supersymmetric algebra, it's not possible to study all the class, all the super Young's theory in D equal to two, three, and four dimensions on the lattice. For example, uh, when I say yes, so odd folding and maximal twos are two different ways. So when one of them works, second one also works. So for example, in three dimension, n equal to one, we cannot study because it's, it has less, it has a small number of supercharges. But we can study the eight supercharge and the 16 supercharge. But in four dimension, n equal to four is the only thing we can study. And the reason for that is, uh, is pretty clear because if your target continuum theory doesn't have enough supersymmetry, then you cannot save a fraction of that on the lattice. But if the target continuum has like 16, then you can, so you want to start with targeting some theory which has more supersymmetry so that uh, you can, we have more hope of keeping the uh, subset of that. And one of the requirements of doing the twisting procedure is that you should have sufficient Susie, as I mentioned, the, Clearly, maximum supersymmetric theories in all dimensions be equal to four or less than four satisfy. So this is good for holography. So this tells me that what we want to study using for holography is actually also consistent with what uh, theories can be constructed properly on the lattice. So that is a good news. So there are other attempts to study. So for example, when I say that n equal to one in four dimension cannot be studied using these methods, but there are some groups mentioned here, which are trying to study this theory in four dimension, but they don't have this odd view folding or maximal twos. They have a direct uh, fine tuning lattice calculation problem. So that is one way of study. So lattice n equal to four super angles. The basic idea is that what we want to do is, uh, we, uh, we saw that uh, we had uh, Q and Q bar, anti commutator which was going as P mu. What we want is to do, this has some spinner indices which I'm not writing down. So what we want to basically do is go from this to some sort of a Q squared equal to zero. When Q squared is equal to zero, this is Q D. Uh, so uh, rephrase this, uh, make this Q as Q prime so that Q prime squared is zero. And that is what we, this process is known as topological twisting. So this process is the uh, process of topological twisting. When you start from uh, supercharges, which has spinner indices, and you transfer all of uh, trans, uh, transform all of them into p forms. So you make a one form, you make a uh, uh, so you make a zero form, you make a one form, and you make a two form. So you split the original Q into forms, and then what we do is we put the uh, we put uh, the uh, we preserve the uh, uh, zero form exactly on the lattice. So zero form is preserved while the one form and the two form are not exactly preserved. And then it has a nice interpretation in the lattice uh, construction. So what this means, this process of topological twisting means, what this means is that you take a maximal subgroup. So n equal to four has an R symmetry group, which is SU, SO6. So I don't work with SO6, but I, I take a SO4 subset of SO, uh, SO6. And then I already have a SO4 Euclidean rotation group, which is just the usual uh, space-time symmetry group. And then I take a cross between SO4 Euclidean and the SO4, which I have mod uh, modded out of SO6, and then take the diagonal. And that is what I call SO4 twisted group. So now all the field transform under this group, SO4, not under the origin SO6. So this is some sort of a... Uh, uh, change of uh, change of approach to studying n equal to four, but uh, this uh, it is widely accept, uh, like uh, known that uh, this topological twisting, at least in flat spaces, just like has the same spectrum and has the same properties as the original n equal to four. So this is the basic idea. If we look at the table now, it is clear why, which I already mentioned, it is now clear that why certain theories cannot be twisted because if I go back to this. And I look at the R symmetry group of this, which is SOU1, and this is SO2 cross SU2. So you can never take a diagonal subgroup of these with SO4. You can never take a diagonal subgroup of these with S, uh, uh, SO, for example, U1, you cannot take, uh, so you cannot take, for U1, you cannot take a diagonal subgroup with SO3 in three dimensions. 
So that is why those things are not possible. You should have a sufficiently large R symmetry group so that those that process can be uh, you know, take, uh, carried out. To do all this, we have a special lattice, which is not very well known to lattice theorists. So usually when we talk about lattice QCD and other things, so we usually work with hypercubic lattices. But uh, for supersymmetric gauge series, what we need is A4 star lattice, which is a little different from hypercubic lattice. And for A4 star, a good way of understanding what A4 star is, is to look at this uh, diagram uh, picture below. So this is A2 star. So in A2 uh, two dimension, the A2 star is a triangular or hexagonal lattice like shown below. So A4 star is just a four dimensional version of what is shown here. And the good point, uh, the good thing about this A4 star lattice has that it has, uh, it has a larger point group symmetry than the hypercubic lattice. And those larger point group symmetries helps you to uh, restore the uh, SO4 of the Euclidean uh, group when you take the continuum. So these are five links, which is, uh, uh, so A4 star lattice has five links, just as A2 star has three links. And then we can lay down the original uh, 10 field components of the N equal to four theory. 10 because there are six scalars and four components of the gauge field. So six plus four is 10, and then you can lay out you can construct a complexified gauge links for A4 star lattice, and then you can put them uh, on this uh, A4 star lattice easily. So that is a natural description. So that is useful to study in the studying supercomputing systems. So we have developed a code uh, which is open access. If you are interested, you can look at the code. Everything is the action and other things, uh, the twisted action and everything is there. We also do all the numerical computation, like calculating the phase of the fermionic determinant, which I'll talk about and other things. And this is work in progress. So now, as I already mentioned, I will not uh, spend time on uh, lattice n equal to four superangles, but I will just do a dimensional reduction to uh, three dimension. And the reason for that is mm, pretty clear. Uh, lattice n equal to four in itself is extremely hard. And it is not possible, at least I think, to study at large and in lambda in practice using modern techniques like classical computers or classical algorithms. Uh, also, there's a sign problem at strong lambda for n equal to four superangular theory which is uh, not the case for dimensionally reduced theories. There are additional complications in n equal to four theories because it's a super conformal field theory. It has no scale. It has modulized space, flat directions, and so on. So those things makes uh, simulations a little tricky. Uh, and that's why I think sorry, n equal to four is sorry, really right. hard. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, Dindu. What is the origin of that sign problem? Sorry, can you repeat? I didn't hear your, what you asked clearly. What is the origin of the sign problem in N equal four? Oh, I see. So N equal to four, I think uh, we don't have a theoretical understanding of what is the origin, but I think the uh, it's the Yukawa term that is bringing the sign problem. So the coupling of the X to the size in N equal to four. So uh, the six scalars uh, which we have, uh, in uh, uh, n equal to four, uh, when it is coupled by the power term, that brings the sign problem. So if you if you drop that term, the sign problem uh, vanishes. Like we see that the, it becomes very milder. But you cover term is. Uh, but you 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 will have the uh, such you cover terms in lower dimensions as well. Correct, correct. That's absolutely correct. But the reason. Uh, uh, reason we don't see the sign problem in lower dimension, I think, is because sign emergence of sign problem is also related to how much supersymmetry are you you are preserving in that four-dimensional theory. So, for example, if you are preserving a larger fraction of supersymmetry, then probably you'll see the sign problem at lambda equal to ten in n equal to four. So, what happens in lower dimension is that you can go to a stronger values of lambda because. Uh, because you are, you, so, so lambda of five is like lambda of 10, 15, because there's a factor of NT between three dimensional lambda and four dimensional lambda. So that helps you with the, you covered, at least that is my understanding. But do, do you know if there's a sign problem in the continuum 
or can you prove that no, there is no, no sign problem? In no, I don't know. I don't know whether there is. The only theory, the only theory whether where I know there is no sign problem in the continuum is this one, uh, the one uh, up here. This theory has no. Uh, at least I know a theoretical uh, basis where this theory has no uh, sign problem in the continuum. But I don't know about any of these d equal to four theories whether there is a rigorous proof that there is sign problem or no sign problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, if if you know about some calculation in four dimension where it's shown, yeah, maybe I you can tell me later on. But I have no idea. Okay, so I'll continue on this. It's, yeah. Okay. So the plan for today. Uh, so okay, let me just uh, quickly mention uh, that it is less complicated to study these lower dimensional. Uh, version of this theory, and they are not confirmable. So computational costs are under control because we don't have to deal with four-dimensional lattice volume. You just deal with uh, one-dimensional lattice volume or three-dimensional. And also sign problem, which we have checked, doesn't seem to, uh, at least for the range of couplings which we have looked into, doesn't seem to matter for the lower dimensional curves. I don't have an analytical or a rigorous proof of why this is true. This uh, observation we have made. Okay, so the plan for today is uh, we present ask, our I results from. Can you ask yeah. a question? This, yeah, I, sure. I understand sure. correctly, the sign problem is the sign of the fermion determinant, right? That's what yeah. you mean, the sign problem, okay? Yeah. So how, it's, how do you. It's think? actually a Fafi, it's a Fafi and Bal, Bal yeah. that enters in these. Yes, problems. I understand. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. How do you tell whether it, it is there or it is not there by the from the look? I mean, how do you know it disappears in the continuum in some cases? I mean, how do you check what its influence is? Yeah, I mean, so I think the way I think, yeah, I think, I, I think at, least, at least I can tell you the numerical way of, uh, the, uh, of how we check this. So what we do is we start with the supersymmetric theory, which has bosons and fermions. Uh, and then what you do is you integrate out the fermions. So when you integrate out the fermions, you create an effective action. And once you have that action, you make a you make the calculation in a phase quenched approximation. Phase quenched approximation means that you assume that uh, the phase is positive definite. It's not fluctuating a lot. Like so, when you uh, when you integrate out the formulas, there's no fact phases which are troubling the calculation. When the phases trouble the calculation, the numerical calculation cannot be done. And that is when we say that there is a sign problem. Because sign problem comes when you integrate out the fermions and that picks up a sign in the effective action and a complex term, which can, like, which can, plug, which can make the uh, probability uh, distribution negative or positive. Just because there is a sign coming from uh, integrating out the fermions in the front, effectively speaking. Hmm. I, I understand that, but I am asking is, you said that in some sure. cases the side problem is not there. Yes. How do you know? Yes. Okay. Perhaps, perhaps I can explain. Well, yes. if you can find a bipartite structure in your fermions so that you have a. Matrix. Your voice is breaking. Yeah. So that you can make the. Uh, you make the off-diagonal terms in, into a, 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 a and an a dagger, then the Fafian is guaranteed to be real and positive. You can see that the Sorry, that I, I miss the your determinant words. is positive. Say again. In some cases, you can you know the determinant sign. That's what you mean. Yeah. The determinant. Uh, huh. Huh. Say again. Again. I will try a different. The um, if you, if you can find the bipartite structure, so that you can you you know that the that the fermions split into two different types, which are complex conjugates of one another, and they, and and you have some pairing uh, that there is no no mixing between them, then, then you can establish that it's positive. So there's a cancellation of phases. 
so, so, so let me... yeah the cancel the phase yeah i thought of that but in general that is not the case no you have some... yeah, yeah 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 in general in general it's difficult to find theories where uh, there is no sign like usually you have the sign problem but for example depending on the number of flavors of fermion or the calculating maybe the eigen values of fermionic operator are coming in pairs so there is a systematic cancellation sort of that those sort of thing can uh, tell you that there is no sign problem but in usually in these supersymmetric angles cases there is a sign problem because those properties at least are not there yeah in any chiral model there will be sign problem uh, yes that's i think yeah that, that's 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 true that's true yes i think i think yeah this is a good point because i think there is a research program carried out by uh, david tong and other people and they are saying that the old problem of constructing lattice gauge theory, chiral lattice gauge theories is actually related to sign problem so at least at least this is something so sign problem and chiral lattice gauge theories are very intimately related but i don't know much about that so i shouldn't say but what but, you are saying is correct yeah so it, yeah. one uh, unfortunate fact i think is that one cannot discuss anomalies in this way of handling the determinants one is putting a modulus on the determinant okay yes so yes the entire anomaly calculations is coming from the face of the determinant okay that's true yeah. yes in yes. the continuum we know that so yes yes for example chiral anomaly is for in the spontaneous breakdown one cannot study those things here am i right that's true i think that's uh, that's why people have as they always have problems with those things on the lattice okay. that's true bar yeah okay yeah but those things are not here because those anomalies at least in, we don't have any, something like theta term or things like that so mm. those things are not there okay okay so maybe i can just continue uh so the plan for today uh, uh i'll present two models as i've already mentioned which is p equal to 2 and p equal to 0 uh, mod, uh, modification i'll i'll show what it, uh, what i mean by p equal to 0 modification so these are the two trees which i'll uh, discuss today some results which we have been doing for the past year for the past couple of years so 3d n equal to 8 super angles this is a three dimensional super angles and has a holographic description at a large uh, n and strong coupling in this case the black holes are known as black d2 brains uh, the weak coupling which is the high temperature thermodynamic behavior is expected to be going as t cube so t is just a dimensionless temperature here so the small t is dimensionless temperature capital t is the dimension full temperature the normal temperature so in the high temperature limit it goes as t cube while uh, the power law behavior uh, of the energy density changes at strong coupling when the theory admit a holographic description now using the type 2 supergravity metric and other things it is straight forward to compute the hawking temperature associated to the supergravity metric and also compute the internal energy which i just write down here so as you can see those are very uh, they're not very system like it's like geometric factors you see pi gamma and you see p so for example if i want to calculate the internal energy of the black hole of n uh, black d2 brain i just go to these formulas and put p equal to 2 and that will give me d2 brains and so on so these are derived from the usual method of deriving the hawking temperature or any temperature in a uh, gr calculation and the important thing to note is that the both of them go as n square so that is the basic counting uh, n square degrees of freedom and this is the pre factor uh, and the coefficient so there's a power also included here and uh, uh, everything except t will give you the coefficient so these are the expression now if i take these expression and work out the calculation of what it should be for my case of p equal to 2 i see that the action density which we measure on the lattice uh, should go as uh, this for low t and should go as this for high t so high t is expected t cube dependence and supergravity calculations uh, tell me that the low temperature uh, power is 10 over 3 so they are very close uh, but uh, they are different 
and that is the interesting thing that as you flow from the high temperature regime to low temperature where it's holographic description the power of t changes and the energy density changes and so on now it is worth noting that uh, the general uh, energy density or the action density goes as this power of t and if i put p equal to 2 i'll get 10 over 3 if i put p equal to 3 in this it becomes the interesting n equal to 4 case where it's t4 in both the cases so if you put p equal to 3 here uh, it's the same power for both high temperature and low temperature and that is just a result which is because of the case uh, reason that it is a conformal case so in n equal to 4 whatever temperature you sit at if you compute the energy density it will go as t4 but that is not true for smaller uh, uh, supersymmetric maximum supersymmetric theories as I can see here. And this is one of the challenging problems of reproducing this result. So what we want to do really is to look at this expression and reproduce this uh, on the lattice. If the lattice can reproduce this, then this is a direct check that the lattice calculation agrees with the supergravity calculation. And there is some sort of uh, 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 agreement with the conjectured holographic uh, correspondence in these cases. So now one of the interesting things which we have to keep in mind is that when we consider the lower dimensional theories, unlike ADS-CFT, you don't have a holographic description at any value uh, at large n and lambda. You only have a holographic description in these cases when the radius of curvature basically is large in units of alpha prime. So alpha prime is the inverse uh, string tension. And this implies that the coupling is large. The string coupling should be small because to make a uh, you know, classical string, uh, low energy string theory computation, you have to have G's S uh, pretty small. And you can, we can combine these two condition to get a condition, which is this. So only when this is true is lattice calculation actually probing the supergravity limit. And this is just the fact that the coupling is greater than one, but the n has to be taken to infinity faster than the coupling according to this power. So if I put p equal to two in this, it gives me some well-defined region where the supergravity description is valid. So this has to be, if you are outside this, then we cannot match to the super uh, the gravity calculation because uh, they, are, uh, they are not there because uh, the, uh, they become strongly coupled and then the string theory methods and other things fail and we don't know much about that. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we go, we start from the high temperature limit of the 3D n equal to 8 super Young mills and then slowly reduce the temperature to go towards the holographic regime. What happens in that is that some, yeah. So uh, what basically we do is we fix the value of n. So n is equal to eight. So basically we look at SU eight gauge theory on a lattice of volume 16 to Q. So we start from the high temperature and this is uh, the orange curve which is shown here is the result which we expect. And these are our uh, Monte, uh, Monte Carlo data, which sit uh, roughly on uh, this high temperature expectation already at SU8. What I show by dashed line is the supergravity prediction. So this is supergravity. The dashed is supergravity. So we see that high temperature is closer to this and low temperature should be closer to this. That is the usual expectation is if all the calculations are consistent. One of the things which we see uh, which we monitor is the phases of the Wilson line uh, uh, eigenvalues. So we compute the Wilson line along the uh, uh, spatial direction, and then we uh, compute the phases. And what happens is at very high temperature, the distribution should is expected to look like a delta function with a very narrow support. As we see that when we go from t equal to one to t equal to two, that is going from blue to green, Blue is spread out till this, and red is only spread out till this. So as I take T to infinity limit, the distribution is becoming narrower. 
So this is this is telling me that, that I'm in a high temperature phase for sure because the Wilson line eigenvalues are basically in a proper deconfined phase and uh, accumulating around zero. And this uh, energy plot is also telling us that uh, our calculation is correct. This is work done in this paper with uh, Simon, uh, Joel Geet, David Shake, and Toby Weiss, where we studied this three dimensional. Sorry, so these plots are from this paper. So the, once we are happy with the high temperature results and make sure that our numerical calculations are correct, we, what we do is we go to low temperature phase. In the low temperature phase, it becomes really uh, interesting. Uh, so we go to dimensionless temperature of 0 0.31 on a lattice, which is 12 cube. So L equal to 12 means or 12 cube lattice. Now, the interesting thing is now, that in the large, is there, is there a question? You have a deconfining transition between that's the two. Correct. That's, that's, that's correct. correct. Okay, very good. That's, that's correct. So what happens is uh, uh, this distribution at low temperature should ideally look something like this. If it was an ideal world, it would look something like this. And this is the relative frequency, and this is the phase. So if this is the case, then we say that the phase we are probing is the supergravity phase, which is known as uniform D2 brain phase. But this is only a strict limit in the sense that this is only supposed to happen at n equal to infinity. So we plotted the n dependence via n equal to 4, n equal to 6, and n equal to 8 to see what really is happening as we are taking n large. So what really is happening when we take n large is that as we go from red to blue, the red uh, cur uh, histogram shows you that you have a uh, distribution like this. And as I take n large, so red is here, green is here, and then blue is here. So it's becoming more and more uniform. So basically, the this thing is shrinking and this thing is rising. So obviously, it's going to this in the large limit. So this is perfectly consistent with what we expect uh, from uh, being in the proper supergravity phase of a uniform D2 brain. So since we are happy that we are in the right uniform D2 brain, let's just see how does the bosonic action density fares against the supergravity prediction. So that is shown on the plot on the right. So as I showed before, this is the high temperature plot. This is the low temperature supergravity calculation. And we start from T equal to two, but then we reduce T to go from 0 0.48 to 0 0.29. And we see that as we lower the value of uh, T, this curve is tending to undecided. So the, uh, the blue data points are on the biggest volume. So let's just track that. And that is tending towards this. So there's a clear deviation from the high temperature asymptotes to the low temperature asymptotes in the sense that it's going from the power expected at high temperature to that at low temperature. And this is not a, uh, 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 this is not a uh, proof that holograph is correct, but this is a non-trivial evidence of a qualitative behavior that the whole there is some sort of uh, holographic interpretation which is happening because. Uh, the curves are, uh, go, uh, the, the data is inter, uh, going between this high temperature expectation and low temperature ex expectation. And this is all at n equal to eight. So it already becomes very harder. So SU8 on a three dimensional lattice volume is already harder. So you couldn't go to lower temperatures. If you, if you can take n equal to higher, then you go to a place where the signal to noise ratio is really very, comp uh, the, the computation becomes complicated. And, uh, this is consistent with zero already. So you need a larger N to really make sure that the vacuum energy or that this energy which we are calculating, which is the energy above extremality for the black hole, is really finite and not zero here. Okay, so one of the things which I just passed is that the lattice calculations which we do uh, is the Q exact formulation, which I uh, explained before, but we have to add some extra terms to make the numerical calculation stable. And that terms are something which depends on zeta square parameter. And those are SUSY violating. This is related to the base, uh, story of the flat direction. So to regulate the flat direction in three dimensional theory, we add some term and then we extrapolate that term to zero. So we do it for different masses and then extrapolate to value. So the values which you are seeing in the right plot 
is something which you obtain from this. So we take the zeta square to zero limit, take the volume as big as we can, uh, take the gauge group as large as we can, close it to planar limit, and then make this plot, which is here. So this is uh, the first study some anyone has done uh, in a higher dimension. There are a lot of work done in zero plus one dimension, as I'll explain later on. But this is a higher dimensional version where deconfinement transition is happening with a non-trivial thermodynamics of a non-extremal black hole. Uh, which we are trying to study on the lattice. Okay, so what are the future direction which we want to study in this case? There's an interesting paper by Ray and Lee and Maldasena in 98, uh, uh, which came out, I think, uh, within two days, uh, where they calculated uh, uh, something in this three dimensional n equal to h to pre animal theory. And that is known as they calculated the behavior dependence of how the supersymmetric Wilson loop. Uh, goes with lambda. So what I mean by supersymmetric Wilson loop, I should just explain. So we know the Wilson loop familiar from QCD, but in QCD, you only have the gauge fields, A, B, U. But in this supersymmetric Wilson loop, you also have the coupling to the scalars. So you have something like uh, uh, A. There are six scalars in gauge fields. So a Wilson loop, which also has contribution from scalars, is known in the literature as supersymmetric Wilson loop or baldes a wilson loop. So they, they found using the dual gravity computation that the log of the expectation value of the Wilson loop should go as the cube root of the Thuft coupling. So this lambda is dimensionless lambda. So lambda in 3D is dimension full. So you just appropriate, make appropriate multiplication with inverse temperature. So this is the inverse lambda. So this should go as one by three. So this is one of the things which we want to study now. Uh, we want to measure the expectation value of the supersymmetric Wilson loop and the lattice and see how close are we to this uh, uh, dependence which is expected. And uh, another interesting uh, problem which you want to study in the next couple of years is to understand the 3D super Yangles phase structure. So super Yangles has, I told you about the deconfinement transition which takes between this D2 uh, brain phase to some other D brain phase, but there are some other subtle uh, phase transitions and crossovers. So it would, it would be nice to make a complete chart. It would be nice to chart out the complete phase structure of this theory as a function of coupling. So that is the future direction. Now I'll just go down to zero plus one dimensions, which is the second model I want to talk, uh, uh, discuss in this talk. And that is uh, the zero plus one dimensional matrix model, which is the dimensional reduction of the same theory. And this is known as a BFSS matrix model. So this is the simplest holographic gauge theory with well-defined gravity dual. I say simplest because this is in zero plus one dimensions. You don't have spatial dependence. You just have the time. And then you have the action with the usual uh, kinetic and the commutator term. And you have the, the Fulmani kinetic term and the Yukawa term. So this BFSS model has been well studied. Uh, BFSS model is named after the authors of this paper and BMN model, which I'm going to discuss. This is named after authors of this paper. So BMN model is a massive deformation of BFSS model. So if I start with this BFSS model, which is coming from the n equal to one super angle, I add some terms which depend on some mass parameter, mu, which I'll discuss later on. And then I come, uh, get something which is called BMN matrix model. The good, uh, the thing about BFSS matrix model is that it has a SO9 R symmetry group. But when we add these mass terms, what this mass term does is that it breaks the nine scalars into a set of six and three scalars. So basically in group theory language, it just breaks the SO9 symmetry to SO6 cross SO3 because it gives different masses to six scalars and a different mass to the remaining three. The interesting thing is that the BFSS has a single deconfined phase. There's no, there's no phase transition in the BFSS matrix form. But when I add these mass terms, there is in the BMN model, there's a deconfinement phase transition. So this mass term, adding of these mass terms opens, opens up the axis basically. And then you can vary these mass terms as a function of temperature and so on. And then you have a deconfinement phase transition. So in that sense, BMN is a richer model than BFSS because you have interesting phase structure and other things which I'm going to explain about. So BMN model, I just told you before that there's some S mu, but writing it more explicitly, uh, as I said, this is SO3 mass term, SO6 mass term, there's a Myers term, which is the, which depends on, uh, uh, which is a cubic scalar term, 
and then there's another term which depends on the formulas. The good thing is that the BFS symmetric model has the usual story of the flat direction, has usual flat direction. But as soon as I give these masses to SO3 and SO6, these are lifted and the BMN matrix model has no resulting uh, flat direction. So it is uh, simulation wise, it is easier because flat direction create some problem in our numerical calculation because of well -known, some well known reasons I'm not going to discuss. It. In addition, there's cubic scalar, which is the Myers term. And for this model, uh, the dual gravity description is only valid when uh, G, which is the dimensionless coupling, which is defined as lambda over mu cube is greater than one, and mu is less than one, and n is taken to infinity. So if I keep all these conditions true, then I'm in the proper dual gravity uh, uh, description. Like I have a dual gravity description. If mu is great, if mu is, mu is much larger than one or g is much smaller than one, then there's no at least a holographic description. Maybe there is, but it's not very good. So when, so let's, I'll, I'll uh, so this is g equal to lambda over mu cube. So when g is lambda over mu cube, I can, I'll initially study the g equal to g going to zero limit, which is the free limit where the mass term is very large. So mu going to infinity limit. In this case, uh, the model becomes a supersymmetric gauge uh, Gaussian model. And this has been well studied. And the critical temperature of the deconfinement transition is, has been calculated. It is given by these. So lambda, if I put lambda equal to 0, it gives me 0 0.076. But these are correction at order lambda and order lambda square. Uh, the thing to note about this is that it increases with lambda. But after some lambda in, uh, outside the radius of convergence, this is no longer true, obviously. But when lambda goes to infinity, there's a description in terms of gravity. So at g equal to zero, I have this description. At g equal to infinity, I have a gravity description, which I'll come to. For lambda equal to zero, the critical temperature in terms of, uh, in uh, units of mu is 0 0.076. So uh, uh, this has been work done by Denjo and collaborators in this paper mentioned here. We have also a lattice proceeding in this, and we are doing uh, other, uh, there are upcoming work which are going to study this model in more detail. Now, I mentioned the G to zero limit. Let's look at the G to infinite limit. G to infinite limit, obviously we have to use the dual uh, gravity setting to do the calculation. And though in this case, the zero temperature type two so solutions of this BMN model is known via the work of Lin, Lunin and Maldesena, uh, for finite temperature black hole, it is difficult to do calculation. One such calculation was done in this paper by Costa, Penazora, Santos, and collaborators. And they calculated that the critical temperature is 0 0.106 in the large end limit. So basically, there is a G to zero value of the critical temperature, and there is G to infinity value of the critical temperature. What we are actually seeking is what happens to this critical temperature at finite G. And at finite G, there's no tool. Uh, you cannot do the gauge model or you cannot do the dual grip description. So that is what we wanted to look uh, using lattice calculation. So that was one of the motivations of our work. So let me briefly sketch the conjectured phase diagram of this BMN model. The two phases, the deconfined phase shown in red, uh, blue confined phase shown in blue. This is a figure taken from the paper just mentioned before. In the gravity limit, which is the this limit, the, the temperature is 0 0.106. In the free theory limit, in this, it's 0 0.076. What we are seeking in this dashed line, what happens to this line? Does it look something like this? Does it look something like this? Is the, uh, does it look something like this? It, it is not well. So that is one of the things we want to study. Now, this might remind you of a similar problem in four dimensional n equal to four super young theory. In the 90s and even in the early 2000s, there was a uh, there was a well-known three by four problem or three by four behavior in finite temperature n equal to four super n, which just tells you that if you calculate the entropy uh, in n equal to four at lambda equal to zero, and you calculate the entropy at lambda equal to infinity at finite temperature, there's a factor of three by four between them. So they are not the same. They're three by four. If I look, this is 0 0.106, 0 0.0. It's not three by four, but this is, uh, I call this a baby problem, a baby three by four problem. So that is a four dimensional problem, but this is 
uh, in zero plus one dimension, it looks uh, similar. That there is some high temperature, uh, low temperature, uh, sorry, low coupling, uh, weak coupling value and high coupling value, and doesn't know. Uh, does, we don't know what happened. So that is one of the things we want to try. Okay, so what do we look at when we want to study this phase transition? This is a deconfined phase transition. So we look at the Polykov loop because it's just a temporal direction. So this Polykov loop, uh, and this is one of the uh, time time series plots which I'm showing here. So this is the imaginary axis of uh, imaginary uh, value of the Polykov loop, and this is the real value. What we see is these are the lobes. So this is for X U sixteen. So if you see that these are the 16, so Z16, 16, 16 roots of unity or something like that. So these are spread like this, but then it goes between these to these, the tunneling happening. So this is close to critical temperature. So when we so, uh, when we are looking at the critical temperature, we follow the evolution of the formation of these lobes. And uh, basically this translates to some value for the modulus of the Polykov loop. And then we look at the susceptibility and then we uh, determine the phase transition. If we could, if we could uh, look at the susceptibility and see the scaling with n, then we can probably look at understand the order of the phase transition because the, this is supposed to be a first order phase transition, but we don't have sufficiently large n so that we can say that it's first order. But this is how we determine where the transition is happening. So let me show a uh, uh, preliminary plot. As I mentioned, this is the gravity expectation 0.106. This is the perturbation theory result. Uh, uh, the, there are two curves. So this curve is order lambda or order G. Uh, and this is order next to next leading. Uh, this is NLO basically next to leading. Uh, this is NNLO. So this is lambda, um, uh, this is G square or lambda square. And we can see that our data here, data here is consistent. And as we go to uh, larger G values, it starts to deviate obviously from this expectation but it is already outside the radius of convergence of this. So this is a non-trivial point which we are getting from our lattice calculation. And we are also getting uh, another data point for a larger value of G and it is already getting very close to uh, N. So this, I think th we are seeing this because this is for SU16, this, this plot is for SU16. And we think that uh, we are seeing that uh, the N equal to eight data was something like here. N equal to 16 is here. So a large N is going to stabilize this. That is our expectation. So this is probably going to go down. And then the basic cartoon, which will happen is something like slow convergence to the super gravity. And this is, so we cannot go beyond this at the moment because of our uh, limitation of the lattice computation. But uh, uh, we feel that the uh, large N is going to make things better and we'll be able to probe higher values of G. So what are the challenges? Let me mention the challenges of the previous plot I showed. We have been only be able to go to N equal to 16, which is not strictly the planar limit. For example, in BFSS, the state of the art calculation go to uh, N equal to 32. So they consider SU 32 bridge group. But in here, we only have N equal to 16. So maybe going from 16 to 32 will make things better. One of the things is that with n equal to 16, we can only go to a maximum g of 0 0.2, which in some units where uh, lambda is set equal to one is mu of 1.71. But this is not strictly the super gravity. Limit. Super gravity, I need this to be greater than one and this to be less than one. So that is the reg regime uh, we are going to probe in our uh, upcoming world. So what we are doing is basically only go charting the path between the perturbative and the super gravity. So we are neither in the perturbative regime nor in the super gravity, but somewhere in between. But we are uh, trying to uh, go towards the super gravity. Uh, the computational complexity of the code of our parallel software goes as n to the seven over two. So increasing n is very expensive. So as you can already see, if I double n, it becomes some more than eight times, probably 10 times. So it's hard. So these are the challenges which we are going to address in the future by parallelizing the software over the matrix degrees of freedom seems essential in the sense that uh, uh, we have n over n matrices. Maybe we uh, split the n over n matrices into sub blocks that is split over the matrix degrees of freedom and then deal with all those blocks separately. So those are the things which we are uh, trying to understand. And what are the future direction two in this model? 
So BMN matrix model is a deformation of BFSS matrix model. The BFSS matrix model was studied, well studied in the past 10 years by these authors. Uh, but our program is to study the thermodynamics for the BMN matrix model. So thermodynamics of BFSS is well known, but thermodynamics of BMN on the lat is still uh, early works. Then Joe has done some work in 2018 paper. But what we really want to understand is that in the for BFSS, E by N square, there's some non uh, trivial dependence on temperature and some coefficient. So this has been exactly reproduced by lattice calculation. So that is a very good check. For BMN model, what happens is, in addition to this, there's a function mu over T. Because when you set uh, F, when F mu over T for mu going to zero, this goes to BFSS matrix model, which is just 10.4. So this is just one, which is equal to one. So what we really want to understand is what is this function for BM and matrix form? So that will help us to understand uh, that, will, that will be a valuable contribution of lattice computation to people who uh, construct finite temperature black holes and those who are uh, studying this model in uh, string theory. Another future direction which we want to understand is that, as I already said, the full BMN model, gauged BMN model. So when I was talking about BMN model, I was talking about gauged BMN model, only the singlet sector of the Hilbert space. So the G, uh, so these bracket uh, A and B are denoting the G to zero and G to infinity limits. So 0 0.076 was the perturbative result, 0 0.106 was the uh, uh, gravity result. If I just restrict to the bosonic sector, it is known that the uh, perturbative result is 0 0.089, but it is not known what happens to the bosonic, uh, what happens when we take the G to Z infinity limit in the bosonic sector. So we are trying to understand those things uh, and these are work in progress. Another direction which we want to pursue is what happens when we also include the non-singlet uh, uh, non sectors. So don't consider only the states which are annihilated by the gauge symmetry. Consider all the states which include the non-singlet. So that is what we call the ungaged BMN. And nothing is known about ungaged BMN model. So it's, it's still an open problem, I think. Some few things are known about the ungaged BFSS model. And there is also a lattice calculation for ungauged BFSS model, but ungauged BMN is still an open problem. So that is something we want to look into in the future. And with that, I think uh, I would like to thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the floor is open to questions. I think that was presented. Nobody wants that was presented. There is an echo. It was very, very good. Okay. But I would like to ask how does one compare it with a realistic model like without supersymmetry? We have no experimental evidence of super SUSI. How That's does one right. recover yeah. how does one recover anything about non SUSI theories from here? Is it possible at all? Non so uh, are you talking about non suzy theories uh, which play a role in uh, some sort of a holographic uh, duality ball? Is that yeah, what I, you're trying to say? No. Uh, suppose I want to get some result on, say, the standard model. Okay. How is that? Okay. Or QCD. Okay. Is there any any conceivable manipulation on your calculations where the supersymmetry is discounted? No, not really. I think I think uh, this uh, all uh, all of what I was talking about is strictly related to those supersymmetric theories. So now you can add matter to supersymmetric gauge theories. You can add temperature to break the supersymmetric theories. Those things are people are studying those sort of things. So you can try to add matter to some supersymmetric gauge theories, right? So for example, study n equal to one supersymmetry, add matter, and look at. Uh, uh, some sort of a glue in a spectrum or something. So maybe that tells you something. But what we are doing as I would say, maybe if we can study n equal to four at finite temperatures and look at things like uh, say shear viscosity, bulk viscosity, maybe via that we can make some connection to the quark blown plasma story. But that is uh, that has not been done. So maybe, uh, so there are various predictions from holography about uh, hydrodynamical properties. 
For example, when you take a n equal to four supersymmetric plasma at finite temperature, you expect some sort of a dependence on eta by s entropic density and so on. So those things may be related to real life QGP a picture, but what we are trying to do with these smaller dimensional gauge theories at finite temperature, I don't see a application to standard model. That is a completely different uh, field. Lattice QCD people do that, but yeah, that is that is not. There's nothing in our calculation which we can tune or do. It's just completely different. Hmm. So maybe you or Benjo or Fort can explain. There is an echo. I don't know where it is coming from. Yeah. Why is the what is the interest it, in this? It is coming model? from my system bar. Okay. Uh, unless it is um, different kind of investigation, what is the theoretical interest in BMN or BFSS models? Why are people interested in this? Uh, from a, uh, I mean, I don't from mean an abstract point yeah. of view. Mm. No, no, no. Okay, so I think the reason, the answer to that question is that BFSS and BMN matrix model are the simplest uh, gauge theories. Uh, which have a well-defined holographic description. So for example, BFSS matrix model is supposed to capture the dynamics of M theory in some limit. So it's the simplest thing you can study on the gauge theory side, which can tell you anything about the supergravity side. I think that is the biggest reason why people look into this because everything else is just too hard to numerically study or to even to analytically study in finite temperature. You can study n equal to four using integrability methods, but you cannot hope to do that in a finite temperature setting. If you go to finite temperature, all the integrability, classical and the quantum integrability thing breaks down, right, Bal? Hmm. So finite. If, so if you take finite temperature, you want to do finite temperature, you want to do holography, and you want to do it in the simplest setting, then BFS, BMN matrix model are the only answers to those things. I think that is why even the conjecture which was proposed by BFSS in 96, the title itself says matrix model as M theory, uh, a conjecture. So you want to study simplest gauge theory which captures anything about M theory or string theory. I think that is the motive. So it is string motivated rather than... Uh, yes, yes, certainly. Let me even, even, the, yeah, even the ADS-CFT correspondence is, <laughs> is coming from string theory. I am so, aware. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I want to ask another question. Yeah. Is it any way in making the size of this matrix matrix is large? Yes. Size. So uh, it, it seems uh, linked to the supersymmetry now. Yeah. Am I right? So, yeah. Can we make can you make yeah. a large matrix a large size matrices? Can you take is there any way? No of tuning yeah. the, the matrices. Yeah, so it's a numerical challenge, Paul. Taking N large is a numerical challenge, at least that's what I understand. So what happens is when you have uh, this these models, um, for BFSS people have studied till N equal to 32. Uh, and for BMN, N equal to 16 is I think what we have studied. So making N large is like, if you have bigger computers, if you have some, computers, bigger computer, bigger RAM, better algorithm, you can go to bigger values of them. So it's a computational challenge, I think, more than, yeah, you really want to be a, as large N as possible, but the problem is that N, uh, it's not just, uh, uh, there's 16 supercharged theory bar, right? So there, uh, technically speaking, the uh, formula, there's 16 N squared V times lattice volume for learning degrees of freedom. And those things uh, complicate. If I if I can if I throw away the formulas, I can go to n equal to fifty, n equal to sixty, but formulas make things uh, more complicated because of various reasons. If you want to uh, study the full system, so yeah, one one way which I was talking to some people, which we were talking with some people at TIFR and other things, where uh, what you can do is. So basically, the, it all boils down to multiplying matrices, right? Matrix model, you take uh, multiply matrices and then take traces. That is a basic operation you do. So what you really want to do is you want to split the matrix into sub blocks. 
so you have to do some uh, division of the matrix degrees of freedom and then you have to th that is one way of going to larger values of n and that is exactly how people did su32 for bfss model they divided the 32 by 32 matrices into smaller blocks and then multiplied and took uh, computed using those blocks so that is one uh, algorithmic way of the game of I mean, there are uh, analytic results for in larger limits, okay? At least, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. There are, yeah, uh, yeah. So, purely analytically, is there any investigation uh -huh. of these models in the large N limits? Analytic studies, okay? Like, for example, what replaces the Wigner distribution? I see, okay, okay, I see. Hmm. So you want to look at the density of, okay, I see. For example, or many other things. In fact, there are these conjectures about the master field, okay? Uh, and yes, the, correct. Uh, I'm aware of a, a paper by Gobagumar and uh, Gross, where they claim yeah. that they had a map master field, okay? But- Yeah, that's the 94 paper, yeah. Mastering okay. the master field, yes, mm. yes. Can one add yeah, that? Yeah, but while the problem is that the field content of these theories are is already pretty large. So, for example, you can, uh, as you all know, that master field has been constructed for these uh, zero-dimensional matrix integrals, right? But when you go to a uh, zero plus one dimensions, this is not a this is not a uh, matrix model over the group of Haar matrices or uh, uh, other matrices. This is a there is also uh, time involved here, right? So that is one complication. And the other complication is that the field content is large. You have nine scalars in this model. So uh, you, 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 you're gonna, uh, you have to look into the master field for each of them separately because they are not related to one another, I think, in the, at least in the lambda, large lambda limit. There's, there are some bounds which you can put, but uh, constructing the master field for these models, I don't know. I, I don't think anyone has even tried. Yeah. Hmm. There, was, there was a talk by Lenny Sustain on this, but I don't remember where it was. So he was talking about master, uh, master field for BF. Yeah, but yeah, I don't think this has been any published work. Okay. It's just hard for me. Okay. It was a very good talk, very good presentation. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, very, very nice, uh, Raju. Um, well, I think most of the most of the interest is from the uh, gauge gravity dual side, but one one should remember that one when one puts down a marker somewhere, uh, you can and you have very solid results there. One can always branch out from there, and you can move away and build on that that foundation. So I would. Um, the n equals four has massive deformations. The n equals, mm. yeah, these uh, n equals one star, for instance, which are yeah. Yeah. closely related to it. The difficulty that arises in that setting is that the theoretical side is not so well known. You don't have theoretical predictions to uh, compare with. So you have to get your lattice tool up and ready where, and mm. know that it, and to have some confidence that it's computing things reasonably in a place where you can compare. And I think that that would be a, a lot of the drive that's going on there. Um, one, one, one can deviate, deviate away from that as well then with less supersymmetry. Of the, the advantage is that the supersymmetry gives you control in the theoret on the theoretical side. But, and just back to the Wigner uh, uh, distribution, most of these uh, matrices are actually have a Wigner distribution and there's very little deviation from the Wigner distribution in the, as you go move through the entire spectrum there. All of the uh, uh, interesting things are happening elsewhere. Okay. But these are not Gaussian models. There are interactions. So yeah, yeah. So I they are interactions. Yeah. So why does why does one recover the Wigner distribution? That is, well, the know? Wigner distribution you should remember is really just a, a statement of uh, of central limit theorem. 
if I take you take a, 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 a large number of degrees of freedom, they will exhibit a central limit theorem. Uh, if they're randomly distributed with lots of things that you don't know about. You, you remove a UN symmetry from that, you get a Wigner distribution for the eigenvalues if you organize them into a matrix. They, it's, the it's essentially the same thing was you've got lots of random things here. Most of the structure is going to end up being Wigner distribution. Okay. Okay. Are there other questions? So I, th I think I saw Samuel there. Do you want to uh, jump in, Samuel? Say hello. Hello. Okay. Hi, hi, Samuel. Okay, well, maybe you have some questions. Yeah. Well, the only thing that wasn't completely clear to me is when you showed the plot like three minutes ago with the gauged and ungauged results. Ah, I, I see. No, no, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, is this what you're talking about? Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, how can we express this limit in terms of the mass or the mu parameter of the model? Because both of the uh, limits okay. are known, like mu goes to zero and mu goes to infinity. So how this, this relates to G? Yeah, so this is uh, G equal to zero, uh, so yeah. So uh, I was defined, so G is just lambda over mu cube. It's, uh, so you're asking how G is related to lambda? It's like this. So uh, when you, so this is the mu, mu to infinity limit. This is mu to zero limit, which is the, so at fixed lambda, mu to infinity limit is this, and mu to zero limit is this. So the upper, Right window. Upper right. Yeah. 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 So so the question mark stands for basically the BFS model. Yeah. And no, no, no. The 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 no, the oh, question mark is not for BF. No, the question mark is that when I take the full BMN model, I start from 0 0.076, but the gravity as you keep as you include the fermions and you go to the gravity limit, this is the upper bound. So it is expected that it starts from this and ends at this. So it's bounded. The, the, the G to infinity uh, uh, the item, uh, the strong coupling limit is bounded on the critical term. What I mean by question mark here is that maybe it's it just grow, uh, it just no one knows. Maybe it's 0 0.5, maybe it's uh, 10, T by mu of 10. So I don't know how to bound this. This value is not known. And there are no fermions, obviously, because this is a bosonic model. So maybe there's nothing which stabilizes it. Maybe it just keeps on growing with G. Maybe, it, uh, yeah, so that is the basic idea. What happens to this? Is there a bound on the, this uh, question mark means, is there a bound on that number? Can we say what that number should be just by doing some sort of calculation? Because we cannot do the dual gravity computation, obviously. But can we? In, use this to say what this might look like because this and this comes from some same calculation. You just keep out the formulas, you get this number. Maybe there's some sort of relation between these two numbers. Who knows? Because this will then tell us what is the role of the formulas in the emergence of the geometry and what happens to formulas really at a strong coupling. And that will tell us how important formulas really are for the holography and so on. That is a big set of questions. At least that is what I my. So what we are doing right now is we are starting with this. So we see this in the lattice computation, which is at z equal to 10 to the power minus five. So if you take g equal to 10 to the power minus five, you reproduce this number. And then we keep on increasing g and then see what functional form of g is going to fit it. Is it like growing linearly? Is it going like quadratic? Or, like, how does it go with you? That is one of the things which I meant by that question. Thank you. And if I can have yeah. one more question. Uh, yeah, sure. 
one thing that we saw in the full BMN model with fermions huh. included was the presence of the fuzzy sphere configurations. Are you interested right. in those? Yeah, so we have not yet explored that because we are at, uh, I think we are at sufficiently large values of n that the fuzzy, so for fuzzy sphere, you should be at small values of n uh, because L, if you increase n, it just goes away, those, stuff, uh, those uh, solution, right? Because in the limit, large in limit, it becomes, a, there's no, h bar comes with a, and uh, inverse power of n and n goes large, it just decays, I think. So we are not seeing those things right now, but we plan to look at with like n equal to eight or n equal to six. We have not looked at the fuzzy structure behavior at the moment. So just to be clear for a fixed value of mu, you say that with increasing n, the fuzzy sphere phase fades away? Yeah. Yeah, so with the mu and the g values which we are looking at, we have not seen. Uh, so, yeah, we have, we have not observed fuzzy structure, but I should see it more. I, I'm not, yeah, I yeah, I don't think we see it at n equal to, we are doing n equal to uh, 16 and n equal to 12. I have not looked at the n equal to 8 data carefully. So maybe there is some sign there, but 12 and 16, we don't see fuzzy structure. So surprising, I don't know why. You, you could place uh, the system in a fuzzy sphere configuration because you know there are BPS states at low. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just, yeah, so this and just is all see, around see if you escape from them. Yeah, we have not done that. We, this is all around the trivial vacuum, x equal to zero. So we will plan, we'll plan to probably look at that in the coming months or years. Okay. Yeah, Any because those questions? because I Sorry, think those things ahead. are also oh, no. uh, yeah because I think those things are also related to the fact that which you found in your paper that there are two different transitions uh, which merge when mu becomes smaller right so when mu is sufficiently large maybe there are two different structure phase transitions uh, and then but since we are at sufficiently small like mostly at sufficient uh, large values of g maybe we are beyond that regime. But I don't know much about this, so I shouldn't say this. But yeah, we have not tried anything apart from x equal to zero. Thank you. Other questions? Do we have other questions? Just uh, if not, I will stop the recording and we okay. can continue this. Mm -hmm.